It's time for Security Now. Steve Gibson is here. There is a lot to talk about. Steve's got a unique take on the PHP Git uh, repository hack. He thinks it's actually a good thing. We'll find out more about that. A virtual browser solution from uh, our friends at Cloudflare that looks pretty useful. And uh, uh, a little plug for our friend Rasmus Vind and his Warcraft site. It's all coming up next on Security Now. Podcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. This is Security Now with Steve Gibson. Episode 812, recorded Tuesday, March 30th, 2021. Get me some PHP. Security Now is brought to you by PlexTrack, the powerful yet simple security management platform that helps you to get the real cybersecurity work done. With PlexTrack, you'll streamline your assessments, analytics, and reporting. Visit plextrack.com slash twit and claim your free month. And by... F5. The threat of credential stuffing attacks is one of the biggest risks your business faces today. Learn how you can protect your business by reading the F5 Labs and Shape Security 2021 Credential Stuffing Report at f5labs.com slash twitcs. And by Helm. Helm believes privacy is a right, not a setting. Protect what matters most with Helm. Purchase the new Helm V2 and get a coupon for free shipping when you go to thehelm.com slash security now. The coupon will be applied at checkout. It's time for Security Now, the show where we cover the latest news about the world of security. And boy, is there some news this week. But I guess... You could say that about every week. Steve Gibson's here from the GRC company. When we first started doing this 812 episodes ago, we thought, how will we ever <laughs> fill half an hour? <laughs> uh, now we fill four half hours, and oh uh, there's still more to yes. do. Hi, Steve. Did you have a good week? Had a good week. Yes. Got uh, some work done. Lots of work, actually, on Spinrite. I'll, I'll mention it briefly toward the end. People are happy to hear um, that. Uh Th this 812th episode, I titled, Get Me Some PHP. <laughs> I know why. <laughs> yeah. And my reading is that all of the tech press got it wrong. Um, oh, good. That's yeah. why we count on you. Good. Yeah, I, uh, As I was reading all the huffing and puffing, I thought, you know, I... It's not clear to me that uh, this was anything more than what will end up being a big benefit. But we'll get to that. Um, we're going to begin by checking in on the patching progress or lack, of course, thereof at this point of the proxy logon exchange server mess. Um, we examine a new Spectre vulnerability to hit Linux, believe it or not. Um, so Spectre's not over. Uh, we have a, also a handful of high severity flaws affecting open SSL, probably one of the other things you were thinking of, Leo. Um, still more problems surfacing with SolarWinds code. An intriguing new offer from our friends at Cloudflare, who hmm. just, you know, innovation seems to be their middle name. They keep adding stuff. They're not sitting on their laurels, that's for sure. Um, and we've got some encouraging recognition of the need for increasing vigilance of the security of uh, increasingly prevalent networked APIs. And then, as I said, I want to briefly to just touch on my ongoing work with Spinrite. And then we're going to take a look at um, what was breathlessly reported hack of the PHP projects like main central Git repository server and why I think all the tech press got it very wrong. Uh, and we, of course, have a kind of a fun picture of the week. So I think another great podcast for our listeners. And yeah, no sign of security problems letting up. <laughs> you should do a traffic report. <laughs> and it's all jammed up. In long, long, long the super oh, no. information super highway. <laughs> yeah. Let's talk about you know the red team, right? You know the blue team, but what's in between the red and blue team? The purple team. The purple team is a very important part of. I hope you have a red and blue team. 
keeping track of your company's security and, uh, m and mitigating any security flaws. The purple team is probably the most important part, the interface between red and blue. Our show today brought to you by PlexTrack. They're the purple teaming platform. <clears throat> Are you ready to build a dynamic purple team, but you have no clue how to get started? Are you working to mature your security posture, but struggling with automation and effective collaboration? This is the solution for you. PlexTrack, P-L-E-X-T-R-A-C, is a powerful, yet simple, cybersecurity platform that centralizes all security assessments, pen test reports, audit findings, and vulnerability tracking. PlexTrack transforms the risk management lifecycle, allowing security teams to generate better reports faster, aggregate and visualize analytics, and then collaborate on remediation in real time. It's really about, you know, it's step one is finding these vulnerabilities, but very important, before you mitigate, you've got to communicate. And that's what PlexTrack does. Enterprise security teams can use PlexTrack to automate their pen tests, their security assessments, their incident response reports, and a whole lot more. Automation's nice. It eliminates a lot of error. And it keeps red, blue, and purple teams focused on getting the real security work done and spending less time, <laughs> I almost said typing up reports. Uh, I guess these days you're not typing them, but still, you get the idea. You'll gain precious time back in your team's day. And by the way, it will. Imp you may not care, but it will improve employee morale. And a happy security team, a happy red team, is an effective red team. PlexTrack's solution is a nine-module platform to address pain points across the spectrum of security teams. For, I'll give you a couple of them. I won't go, I won't go through all nine. <clears throat> I will tell you how you can find out about all nine in a second. Uh, as an example, there's the Runbooks module. That'll facilitate your table type exercises, your red team engagements, your breach and attack simulations, pen test automation. It'll improve communication. It'll improve collaboration as all of PlexTrack's solutions do. PlexTrack upgrades your program's capabilities by making the most of every team member and tool. There's also an analytics module, which will help you visualize your posture so you can quickly assess and prioritize. It makes your workflow so much more effective. You know what to work on, what's important, where you're falling down. You can map risks to frameworks like MITRE ATT&CK and create a living risk register. The reports module is second to none for reporting security findings. Code samples, screenshots, even videos can be added to any finding. Import findings from all major scanning tools, export to custom templates with the click of a button. Look, I think you get the idea here. It's all about facilitating the red team, finding the problems, communicating the problems, collaborating with your blue team to make sure everything gets mitigated promptly, effectively. And everybody's happy because it's an easy and fun tool to work with. You can try it free for a month. See how PlexTrack can improve the effectiveness and efficiency of your security team. All you have to do is go to PlexTrack.com slash twit. Claim that free month. P-L-E-X-T-R-A-C dot com slash T-W-I-T. PlexTrack is the purple teaming platform. You got to get some purple in you. We thank uh, PlexTrack so much for their support of security now. I encourage you to use that URL, by the way, so they know you heard it here, PlexTrack.com slash twit. Okay, Steve, I'm ready with the picture of the week. This one I, this one speaks to me. <laughs> I does. had a feeling it would. Yeah, it really does. I, I, uh, so what we have is uh, two service windows. Uh, one, there's a... Uh, big signage over the the one on the left says more gear, you know, get your more gear here. And then the other window next to it says learning to use existing gear. Guess which now, one has the longer line. <laughs> yeah, the guy, the guy behind the learning to use existing gear. Well, he's not asleep because he's reading a book. Uh, you know, with his head propped up with it, uh, on on his hand, uh, there's nobody who has any interest in learning to use their existing gear. Apparently, that there's nobody at his window. The entire line, and it goes right off the screen, is 
Just, I, I need some more gear. Yeah. Yeah, give me some more gear. Don't learn to use what you got. Get something no. new. It'll be much easier. This, I, it's not signed, but it really looks like a rich tenant uh, cart. You know, he did the fifth wave. It was in all the, it was in the Four Dummies books. It was in magazines. Uh, like, I can't remember his PC. You no, know, it was Computer World. That's what it was. Rich tenant. Really looks like might be one of his. You know, and I have to say, I, I often hearken back to, when I was five, because I knew what every button on every piece of equipment that my family owned did. I mean, I just, that was my thing. I was, yeah. it, it made sense That's to me. To I was going to know what it is. Yeah. But, you know, I look at the remote control on, <laughs> on the, whatever it is I've got. And there's buttons there. You got your top menu, your side menu, your, your backwards menu that, you know, the, the, this and the, that. I mean, it's just like, what, <laughs> what is all this? Do I really, all I want to do is go to the next episode of Fringe. It's a I lot harder you know, than it used to be. I, I agree oh, with you. Leo. I don't know if that's us. I don't think it is. I just I think it's know. everything is proliferated to such a degree and and user interface design seems not to have improved enough to yeah. accommodate I mean, all the new even, features. You know, one of the most elegant things about the iPhone was that there was four buttons. I mean, you know, you you clicked a picture and you got a phone or you clicked it when you got notes. You know, they did have a little wood grain problem there and back in the beginning, but still. <laughs> that was to make just, you feel at home. <laughs> there just was like, now it's like, oh, you got to push the screen harder and hop on one foot and then do a little twist with your finger in order. And then you get some secret menu that you never knew was there and and like oftentimes I mean and I'm certainly no guru but I'll do something like I'll swipe along the bottom and and like go back to an app because you like I saw that on one of your shows once Leo and Lori yeah, goes there's, how'd you do that yeah, there's what's no, that there what, used to what? be a home button they took it out <laughs> how do I get out of here <laughs> you know the other day I, I I we were I was doing I was helping her with something in in Chrome. And she was at some link somewhere and I grabbed the, you know, to the left of the URL and dragged it off and dropped it on the desktop. And she's like, what? That's a thing? It's like, oh, <laughs> it's funny. Now, now you have an icon that will get you back there. In time. Wow. She says, oh, she says, wow. I just need to watch you work more often because, you know, but, but again, so yeah, it's, I have it's like baffling four things. for us though. That's got, the that's, yes, you know. I, was I say I have four things that she hasn't figured out, right. but but She's I look impressed. at this stuff and I think, <laughs> you know, what is hidden in you know behind all these user interfaces? I feel bad. I mean, if you and I have trouble, what's a normal person to do, really? And I think that that's why this cartoon is so great because I think really normal people just they don't try. They don't. How how you know? I don't know how to get better using this, so I'm just going to get another one, <laughs> which I'll be just as lost in. But <laughs> oh gosh, I I feel really feel bad for people. Okay, so uh, our 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 weekly proxy logon update. I, I looked for any update from Microsoft. Uh, from Risk IQ, which is you know the people that they keep citing, or any other source to get some sense for how the patching was going, I did discover that Risk IQ is now estimating that only, and I put that in quotes, uh, it, you know, only needs to be in quotes because the the only sense in which it's only is in comparison to the original several hundred thousand vulnerable and unpatched exchange servers that we started out with. So today, we're down to only 29,966 instances of exchange server still vulnerable and thus still wide open to attack. But that's down from the last number we reported, which was 92,072 back uh, around March 10th. Um, and that, you know, nearly 30,000 number appears to be holding. Um, and of course, unfortunately, our experience suggests that especially at this point, right, like anyone who was going to get the news 
got the news in the last three weeks since this happened. So I four weeks, actually. Yeah, one, one, two, three, yeah, four weeks now since, uh, exactly, since March 2nd. So um, uh, we know that any further improvement will be incremental, slow, attritional, and perhaps the result of Microsoft's slipping that useful proxy logon remediation into their Windows Defender solution, since it's able to filter the primary exploit vector from the IIS web server before the, that, that attack reaches the server's tender underbelly. Uh, it's not clear whether Risk IQ is actually testing for the vulnerability, which I don't suspect, or obtaining Exchange Server's version information from, you know, from some log-on hello handshake, which is probably what they're doing. Um, so if that's the case, then Risk IQ's number would be high because it would not be crediting all of those instances of Exchange Server which had not been actually updated, but which did have the Windows Defender remediation slid in and is protecting it sort of without getting any credit for doing so. So it's probably the case that the number's coming down, but, you know, tens of thousands. And as we know, it's like <laughs> there's a battle for who can take control of these servers and what mischief they can get themselves up to. Well, so, and remediation doesn't kick them out. It just prevents new ingress. But if somebody's already in there, they're in there, right? Yeah. Now, it, it, what they did say, without any specifics, is that it will also go and try to find the things oh, good. that it knows of that they may have done. Okay. So so you could see traces you know, of them crumbs left behind. Exactly. Yeah. So so it it may have been able to remove them uh which would also be a good thing. Yes. Um and I need to turn my pardon me. Um trying to get our balances correct now. Having turned up my microphone, now I'm blasting myself <laughs> in the ears. <laughs> I should explain uh, we're using we've used Skype for since episode 1. But we're st we started using Zoom because we're we're concerned. Well, first of all, you never liked from the day Microsoft acquired them the things they did to to change how Skype worked. It used to be peer to peer, then it had a. Now all of a sudden it's going through Microsoft servers. Blah yeah. blah blah. So uh, <clears throat> after much <laughs> after looking for many alternative <laughs> solutions, uh, Alex Lindsay suggested moving oh, to Zoom. Great. He's doing a lot of streaming, obviously, oh. and he knows more probably than anybody about which works best. And we're very happy with Zoom, but <clears throat> it's a whole new set of interfaces and a whole new set of buttons that have to be tweaked. And now it's all wonderful. You yes. sound great. Good. And I'm just a sultry whisper in my uh, own whisper ears. Whisper in your own so, ears. <clears throat> Good. Yeah, and sultry is not a word that's ever been used to describe it. So. <laughs> Actually, okay. the chat room said you have a rich, velvety sound now. So Ah, well, mm. chat room, mm. just be chatting. <laughs> uh, so, uh, Spectre is remaining with us. It's clear. Uh, two weeks ago, we noted that Google's security blog was titled... A Spectre Proof of Concept for a Spectre Proof Web. And they demonstrated two weeks ago and shared their creation of a working Spectre exploit in JavaScript that's able to obtain data from the browser's internal memory. And yesterday, researchers with Symantec's Threat Hunter team disclosed two ways in which Spectre's processor mitigations could be circumvented in Linux-based OSs to launch successful speculative attacks to obtain sensitive information like crypto keys from the system's kernel memory. You know, and what's interesting about these attacks is that on the one in the very beginning, the first time there was any notion of like, oh, you know, we could leak a bit every minute, people were like, you know, who cares? Like, you know, <laughs> a bit a minute. But crypto keys are notoriously dense, right? You need to get all the bits right or you don't have anything. So that's, you know, every single bit is crucial. 
but they're not very long overall. And you really want to hide their bits well. Well, the one thing that this kind of low bandwidth leakage does is, you know, it does get things that you thought were well hidden exposed. So the groups found, uh, the semantic group found two related but different ways to pull off something like crypto key in the kernel memory leakage uh, it, two CVEs have been assigned, uh, and interestingly, they're 2020, 2020, 27170, and 27171. Because these should be fixed, but they do not spell the end of the world or of Linux, they carry relatively mild CVSS scores of 5.5. Um, and they impact all Linux kernels prior to 5.11.8. So the trouble was first identified last year, thus the 2020 CVE years, um, and the Linux teams were notified. Patches for Ubuntu, Debian, and Red Hat were just published on March 17th, and then they were released for deployment on the Saturday before last on March 20th. So um, as I said, there are two. The first one is able to reveal the contents from the entire memory of an affected computer. And the second one, 171, can reveal the contents from the 4 gig range of kernel memory. So, you know, remember that because Spectre and Meltdown are chip level vulnerabilities, operating system patches can only be mitigations which are designed to make it hopefully impossible for an attacker to exploit the vulnerabilities. My point is that the operating system has no ability to address the underlying issue which exists in the processor beneath it. That's, it, it can't get there. You know, it, it is able to load microcode at boot time, and Intel has updated the microcode, and the Linuxes are carrying that, and they are indeed doing as much as Intel has been able to do. But um, it, it's these mitigations for Spectre, which were also incorporated into Linux, which the Symantec group found a way to get around, to essentially bypass the mitigations. Um, so by using these mitigation bypasses on any unpatched Linux before, and I wrote before 5.11.7, but it must be before or including 5.11.7 since the update brought us to 5.11.8. So then malicious code can read memory um, that its process, that is the process the malicious code is running in, should have no permission to inspect. And what's more, the attacks could also be launched remotely through malicious websites running exploit JavaScript. So, you know, that when, when you hear that, that's the concern, right? Because we all, we've often talked about how, yeah, you know, Spectrum meltdown, meltdown, they're not good. We don't want to have our processor leaking between processes, but still, it, it's a it's more of a theoretical than a than a practical issue. We have been led to believe for the last couple of years, and the point has been that if you've are, if you've got a process sharing your your personal system, that's you know try, using Spectre or Meltdown, we've well, already got bigger problems than than. <laughs> than its ability to perform some, you know, difficult to execute memory leakage. But if it's possible for JavaScript running in your browser to do this when it's on a Linux machine, then that's something to worry about. So the Symantec team worked out a way to take advantage of the kernel's support for the extended Berkeley packet filters, uh, known as eBPF, to extract the contents of the kernel memory. You know, the, the uh, Berkeley packet filter, BPF, has been around forever. It started out to be a general purpose, lightweight, 
virtual machine that was used to inspect the 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 contents of network packets the idea being that that if you if you wanted to make a fancy packet inspector you you need a little bit of code to do that you know to perform some pattern matching if you know if this is that then check if this is that and it, you know it's a little more difficult than you could do with a set of fixed rules so they implemented a, a simple virtual machine, the Berkey, Berkeley packet filter, in order to perform, you know, those sorts of simple things and to make them very fast. So because you don't want something slowing down your packets. So anyone who's ever had occasion to use Linux's TCP dump facility has likely encountered the BPF system. Since then, the extended BPF variant has become a universal in-kernel virtual machine which has hooks throughout the kernel in order to do what it needs to get done. So Symantec explained that they, they said, quote, unprivileged BPF programs running on affected systems could bypass the Spectre mitigations and execute speculatively out-of-bounds loads with no restrictions. And that's the no-no which, uh, which Linux was trying to prevent. They said this could then be abused to reveal the contents of the memory through Spectre-created side channels. And specifically, it's in kernel slash bpf slash verifier dot c. They said the kernel, that file, was found to perform undesirable out-of-bounds speculation on pointer math, thus defeating fixes for Spectre and opening the door for side-channel attacks. So, so the point is that, you know, Linux has been hardened against Spectre, but there was a little piece that didn't get hardened. That is that Symantec realized, oops, you could still, you know, do this. So uh, in a real world scenario, until recently, as we know, Spectre has been a bit light on um, unprivileged users' ability to leverage these weaknesses to gain access to secrets. But this allows a way for that to happen. Symantec explained that, quote, the bugs could also potentially be exploited if a malicious actor was able to gain access to an exploitable machine through some previous step. You know, downloading malware onto the machine to execute, to, to achieve remote access, this would allow them to further exploit these vulnerabilities to gain access, for example, to all user profiles on the machine. And again, patches are out. Um, so individuals should have no problem updating themselves, which you'll want to have done since the 20th. Um, but, you know, here we were just talking about the difficulty of getting the world's systems updated, the world's, the world's Windows systems updated. Um, just imagine how, how many Linux systems have not been updated in the past two weeks. You know, many haven't been updated in years and won't be, nev never will be. So Semantic tells us that these unpatched gremlins that they have found can be exploited remotely, uh, unfortunately. Is, is it a firmware update or is it a s operating system update? I mean, it's an OS. It, it's an OS update. Okay. So it the, the problem actually existed in some some lack of remediation against the remaining ways that even after the firmware was updated, that it was still possible to do this. So it's it's in wow. that it's okay. in that C okay. file. Yeah. All right. Well, I you know I'll do the update. The problem with Linux, well, you 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 know, as you point out, that a lot of these boxes are de are designed oh. to just run forever and not be updated. I have a server in the other studio yeah. that you know it's a server. I don't want to update it more than necessary, and it doesn't update automatically. Uh, a lot of people who have desktop Linuxes. In fact, I've seen people complain about this. Are obsessively updating, like every day they update. <laughs> uh, oh, but that yeah. still doesn't guarantee you're going to get the update because the way Linux distributions work, the updates happen upstream, and then they have yep. to be incorporated into the distribution so that your distribution, whatever it is, will see it. Some distributions are slower about that than others. It's not a it's not a uniform process. So. Um, 
Interesting. Well, and yeah. how many appliances, you know, how many turnkey yeah. boxes oh, gosh, of, yes. of one sort or another? I mean, all of the routers, they're all Linux based. Right. Right. So, as our, as, I mean, anything Android based is Linux based. So yeah. there's a lot of Linux out there. Yeah. Yeah. Um, let's take our second break. Okay. I'm going to drink some, I drink some. Water. It feels like our second break, doesn't it? It does. It's <laughs> second break time. <laughs> I like Ooh, this. I like this. Stuff. I like this cool. lower third. This is good. It uh, it's a very. Uh, it looks like carnival happened <laughs> at the uh, F F five labs. It's a it's a party in our lower thirds. You know F five. We talk about F five all the time. One of the best known uh, security companies out there. F five labs. Yep. And Shape Security have issued their 2021 credential stuffing report. Now, if you listen to the show, I think the phrase credential stuffing is, you know what that is. Uh, the problem with it, of course, is you may not realize uh, until spilled credentials are used against you. So it's it's one of those things where you could be, uh, well, Ubiquity is a good example of some spilled credentials happened in December Whoops. And uh, a lot of us are, I, I just, you know, read Brian Krebs' report today. I'm going to go run home and yep. update my password. Stolen credentials are so valuable. Demand is enormous. <laughs> we were talking about a guy who is selling credentials online in a dark website who has retired because he's made something like $8 billion on it. It's a, it's a, it's, at this point, it's a vicious circle. Organizations suffer network intrusions. They're looking for credentials, then credential stuffing in pursuit of profits. Over the last five years, the amount of credential spill incidents has risen 200%. And if you want some shocking numbers, get ready. 10 billion credentials have been spilled. Credential stuffing attacks are now the number one attack type against applications. That proxy logon essentially was an attempt to get credentials, right? or at least yeah. to get access. Access attacks are, of course, the number one root cause of breaches. The tech industry uh, is reeling from the twin shocks of the theft of FireEye's red team tools. I'm just waiting for the other shoe to drop on that one. The SolarWinds Orion supply chain attack. Everything you hear about on the show, pretty much. So F5, the F5 Labs and Shape Security 2021 Credential Stuffing Report has all the information companies can use to get a sense of the relationship between three aspects of the ecosystem surrounding stolen credentials around this 200% increase, theft, sale, and then fraudulent use. The security researchers at F5 and elsewhere have identified credential stuffing as one of the foremost threats. I think you'd probably agree, Steve. I mean, it's a broad yeah. enough term that it pretty much covers a lot of the problems we, we are aware of. In 2018 and 2019, the combined threats of phishing and credential stuffing made up roughly half of all publicly disclosed breaches in the United States. F5 uh, has come up with five distinct phases of credential abuse. <laughs> I like this. This is the five stages of credential abuse. Stage one, slow and quiet, right? Stage two, ramp up. Stage three, blitz. <laughs> then drop off. And stage five is reincarnation. Now, I think some of those are self self explanatory. Maybe not reincarnation. That's why you got to get the report. It's uh, it's all it's all explained in their 2021 credential stuffing report. You can learn how each stage works. Is what's going on. They I think they their point is, and I think it's absolutely true that you need to understand the life cycle of credential abuse, and uh, that's why they're spending so much of time and effort to not just quantifying the trends around credential theft, but to understanding how cyber criminals work, the steps they take to adapt to and surmount your enterprise defenses. So uh, I just want you to check it out. We're going to, we're going to, you know, you listen to this show because you want to keep up on this stuff. Here's another great source. Learn how you can protect your business. The F5 Labs and Shape Security 2021 Credential Stuffing Report is available at f5labs.com slash twitcs. We had to make a special address so they, they know you heard it on security now because we want to get the credit for that. Uh, it's F5, the number 5, L-A-B-S, F5, the number 5, L-A-B-S dot com slash T-W-I-T-C-S. 
In this case, it doesn't stand for computer science. It stands for credential stuffing. F5 labs.com slash twit CS. It's a great read. Lots of information in there. And I know I, for one, I'm always fascinated by how these guys work. I mean, that's, I think, probably why a lot of people listen to this show, because you always explain the, the, what's going on, you know, more than just this is what happened. In fact, I can't wait to hear about this PHP and Git thing, because I think mm -hmm. you're going to have some insight into it that, as you point out, we didn't get from mainstream. F5labs.com slash twitcs. Back to you, Steve. The rich and mellow sounds of Steve. <laughs> By the way, I don't know if you noticed, but I'm glad you didn't come to me earlier because I put in new rubber bands on my... Burke said, oh, I got oh. some. Look at that. Oh, perfect. It's bouncing oh, cool. right in there. Look at that. Oh, it's nice. only been that way for like four years. <laughs> oh. Yours too, probably. Well, on with I, the show. I've not touched it in 15 years. Yeah, exactly. The podcast. They go so, in about yeah. three, so <laughs> that'll give you yeah. some idea. On we go. So the uh, Open SSL project has fixed several high severity flaws. Um, alarm bells were also ringing over at the Open SSL project as a result of a server crash denial of service and a certificate verification bypass. So as we know, for many years, Open SSL contained the main repository of open source crypto magic. Uh, so the Open SSL library was incorporated everywhere that secure communications and certificate management was needed. You know, again, don't reinvent the wheel. Security, especially security code, is hard to get right. So just drop in the library. And the library that was dropped in was Open SSL. Now, these days, crypto's gone much more mainstream, and Open SSL now has many viable newer and quite a bit sleeker competitors. You know, we've talked about Bouncy Castle, CryptLib, GNU TLS, LibGCrypt, we were just talking about recently, LibSodium, uh, NACL, NSS. You know, I mean, there are many alternatives now. Um, and even Amazon, like, created a super svelte uh, TLS implementation for their own AWS uh, AWS stuff. So Do you have one you prefer. I think you used NACL for a Squirrel, right? Or was it yeah, Live Sodium actually? Okay, but yeah. the two are almost Live Sodium and NACL. NACL are, is so is salt, right? So <laughs> right, right. <Yeah. laughs> um, so uh, inertia being what it is, Open SSL remains dominant. So it's under most of the rocks that you will turn over. Uh, it is big, it's bloated, it's creaky, uh, but it remains the reference standard against which the performance of everything else is compared. You know, if you're creating a, a, a clone function, you see what OpenSSL does, and then you make sure that yours does the same thing. So, you know, although it has, by any measure, uh, through the years, been quite robust and secure, its popularity means that when something goes wrong... It's generally a pretty big deal. The biggest previous mess brought to us by OpenSSL was a worrisome little flaw that became known as Heartbleed. Ouch. Uh, and any of our listeners from seven years ago will appreciate what a ruckus Heartbleed created uh, back in 2014. What the two recent discoveries lack... Uh, probably is marketing. Uh, somehow, uh, you know, naming this CVE 2021-3449 just isn't nearly as catchy as Heartbleed, and there's no wonderful dripping blood logo. Uh, but it is still quite worrisome, um, and I think we've probably not heard the end of it. Last Thursday morning, cryptographic engineer Filippo Valsorda tweeted... He tweeted, CVE 2021-3449 looks like it could have been found easily if anyone figured out how to fuzz renegotiation. But, he said, renegotiation is sadness. <laughs> anyway, he says, any, he says, anyway, sounds like you can crash most open SSL servers on the Internet today. And that is true. Bottom line, this lets you crash most open SSL servers, which is to say 
most Linux based, you know, in e and Unix based servers. Um, okay, so that brings us to last Thursday's Open SSL Security Advisory from the 25th of March. The it had two pieces. The first was null pointer deref in signature underscore algorithms processing. And it's describing this first of the two problems, 3449. They they rated its severity as high, and they said an open SSL TLS server may crash if sent a maliciously crafted renegotiation client hello message from a client. If a TLS version 1.2 renegotiation client hello emits, omits the signature underscore algorithms extension where it was present in the initial client hello, but includes a signature underscore algorithms underscore cert extension, then a null pointer dereference will result, leading to a crash and a denial of service attack. They said a server is only vulnerable if it has TLS version 1.2 and renegotiation is enabled, which is the default configuration. OpenSSL TLS clients are not impacted by the issue, only servers. And they said an OpenSSL 1.1, all, sorry, all OpenSSL 1.1.1 versions are affected by this issue. Users of these versions should upgrade to OpenSSL 1.1.1K. Uh, they said this issue was reported to OpenSSL on the 17th of March by Nokia. The fix was developed by Peter Castle and S Samuel Sapolsky from no Nokia. Okay, so... Uh, Note that the advisory just told any malicious prankster how to down most of the Internet's servers that use OpenSSL to provide TLS version 1.2 support, which is pretty much everything today. So that's why Crikey. I said I don't think that we have <laughs> heard the last of it. That's not um, good. No. The, the good news is taking servers down, hopefully is less gratifying today than it would have been 15 years ago. Today, they want to crawl in there. They want to set up their cryptocurrency miners. They, they want to, yeah, you know. Yeah, it's just malicious malarkey yeah. versus actual valuable stuff. Right. Yeah. Still, uh, there's still people, malicious if, malarkey out there. It sure. is. And, you know, having servers down can be pesky. So uh, if, if anyone notices that their servers are crashing suddenly for no obvious reason, well, mm -hmm. uh, you want to update your open SSL. I'm logging in right okay. now. <laughs> now, that seemed a little tricky, right? <laughs> the other open SSL problem was also fixed last Thursday. Could best be described as a weirdo edge slash corner case that you'd really need to try hard to create. But if you did, the result would be a true bypass of certificate verification in OpenSSL. And, you know, that would obviously be very bad since if you cannot authenticate the identity of the party you're having a private conversation with, it doesn't really matter if it's a private conversation. It could be a man in the middle or anyone that you're actually talking to. So, you know, as I was writing this, I thought I w I'm tempted to share the advisory's description just so you'd have a clear example of exactly what a weirdo edge corner case exactly sounds like. And then I thought, oh, what the hell? Here's how the advisory describes the problem that they also fixed. This is CA, you know, Certificate Authority, CA Certificate Check Bypass with X509 underscore V underscore flag underscore X509 underscore strict. Also severity high. Again, this is an authentication bypass for the, for the certificate chain in, in, in OpenSSL and anything you use it for. So not good. So here it is. 
they write, the X509 V flag, X509 strict flag enables additional security checks of the certificates present in a certificate chain. It is not set by default. Starting from OpenSSL version 1.1.1H, a check to disallow certificates in the chain that have explicitly encoded elliptic curve parameters was added as an additional strict check. An error in the implementation of this check meant that the result of a previous check to confirm that certificates in the chain are valid CA certificates was overwritten. This effectively bypasses the check that non-CA certificates must not be able to issue other certificates. Whoops. If a purpose, as in one of the declared purposes for the certificate, if a purpose has been configured, then there is a subsequent opportunity for checks that the certificate is a valid CA. All of the named purpose values implemented in LibCrypto perform this check. Therefore, where a purpose is set, the certificate chain will still be rejected even when the strict flag has been used. A purpose is set by default in LibSSL client and server certificate verification routines, but it can be overridden or removed by an application. In order to be affected, an application <laughs> must explicitly set the X509 V flag 509 strict verification flag and either not set a purpose for this certificate verification or, in the case of TLS client or server applications, override the default purpose. <sighs> Open SSL versions 1.1.1H and newer are affected by this issue. Users of these versions should upgrade to Open SSL 1.1.1K, the one that just came out. And this issue was reported to Open SSL on the 18th of March by Benjamin Kaduk from Akamai and was discovered by others at Akamai. The fix was developed by Tamaz Moraz. So we're not going to lose any sleep over that one. Uh, it must have been. You know, this is not something you would discover, like, in the wild or in the field or anywhere. It must have been that the guys at Akamai were perusing the OpenSSL source uh, because, again, it, this was only introduced in .1H, and we're on K. So they must have been looking at the source and spotted the logic flaw that way. Um, you know, it's never good to have, as I said, to have any way around authentication in a system whose entire purpose is authentication. So it'll be good to have this one resolved. But, you know, there are a bunch of servers out there that, that it's unlikely that, they, that the situation exists that actually triggers this or allows us to be triggered in the wild. Um, and that H subversion came out last September. So the, the window of opportunity, like from, from September till now, H through K has, is just not that wide. It's nothing like the 11 plus years during which Exchange Server has had these flaws. Thus, all Exchange Servers, even ones out of, out of you know, currency, uh, are, are vulnerable to the Exchange Server problems. But still... It's, you know, uh, good to get these things patched. I'm, I'm sure that when we check on, we do our, uh, issue our command to check for libraries in Linux that, or, or Unix that need to be updated, uh, OpenSSL will now pop up and it's like, yep, let's uh, get that code updated. SolarWinds keeps finding new critical problems within its own code. Last Thursday was a busy day. SolarWinds released a new update to its Orion networking monitoring tool to fix four security vulnerabilities, including two that could be exploited by an 
uh, by an authenticated attacker to achieve remote code execution. So that's better than unauthenticated, but perhaps not enough better. Uh, we've talked about JSON deserialization flaws, about how deserialization inherently requires interpretation and how difficult it is to create perfectly robust interpreters. The programmers who write these serializers, that is, you know, and, and that's something that, that turns a dense data structure into a, some sort of a series of bytes, which you can then store, and then later you deserialize in order to restore the original data structure. Invariably, the, the guys who wrote the deserializers are the same ones who wrote the serializers, or at least the spec for that, you know, the, the, the serialization spec. And the assumption is too great that the, you know, that the data that the, that the deserializer will be receiving <clears throat> came from a, the serializer that the same guys wrote. So the point is, you just make the assumption that valid data is what you're being asked to deserialize, deserialize and we have seen time and time again that that results in vulnerabilities which create buffer overruns which end up being critical must fix now problems and the orion web console has one of those uh, the second issue concerns a high-risk vulnerability that could also be leveraged by an adversary uh, to achieve remote code execution in the Orion job scheduler. The release from SolarWinds notes in order to exploit this, an attacker first needs to know the credentials of an unprivileged local account on the Orion server. So not privileged, but at least some credentials required. And the, both of these came from Trend Micro. There are also two others, a high severity stored cross-site scripting vulnerability in the add custom tab within the customized view page and a reverse tab nabbing. We've talked about that in the past and open redirect vulnerability in the custom menu options page both of which require an Orion administrator account for successful exploitation. So it does sound like, you know, the really bad egregious problems are, that we're no, we're no, they are no longer finding those. Uh, so it brings a number of other improvements and fixes along the way. But, you know, as I'm thinking about solar winds and like how bad a problem they've, they've had, how many problems have been fixed, it sort of begs the question, I think, that certainly many people in government and industry must be asking themselves, should solar winds now be abandoned for a hopefully more secure alternative? Uh, the key, of course, is whether an alternative would truly be more secure. It could be that with all the hot water that SolarWinds has recently been in, their code finally got the deep cleansing security scrutiny that it had always needed, so that now it's actually the better solution compared with the others that perhaps haven't had the scrutiny that SolarWinds' time in the spotlight has given it. You know, it's, it's somewhat like the dilemma that an employer faces after discovering some errant action of an employee who sincerely apologizes after being called onto the carpet for it. Is it better to then sever the transgressor's employment over that mistake, or are they now a better employee for having learned a valuable lesson? Again, <laughs> the, the age-old dilemma. In the case of SolarWinds, um, my feeling is that bad code somehow got in there in the first place, and it wasn't found. So, you know, to keep me as a customer in the long term, and I'm not a customer of SolarWinds, but if I were to keep me, I would need to be convinced that not, o not only were all of this handful of flaws patched up and fixed, and that's good, but that the, the flawed system that created them in the first place 
had also received what was apparently some much-needed attention and patching. So, uh, you know, tough to decide whether you, you know, leave something that's been fixed because it was once broken or think, well, now it's fixed. So, you know, the devil you know. Cloudflare is continuing their move toward offering more and more security-related services. Last week, they announced and debuted a web browser virtualization service as part of their Cloudflare for Teams offering. Uh, They call it Zero Trust Browsing. Um, I just really like the things that these guys are doing. Their description explains their, like, the motivation behind it. They said, Cloudflare's browser isolation service makes web browsing safer and faster for your business, and it works with native browsers. Web browsers, they said, are more complex and sophisticated than ever before. And boy, is that a theme of the podcast. They said, they're also one of your biggest attack surfaces. Again, hello, yes. Cloudflare Browser Isolation is a zero-trust browsing service. It runs in the cloud, away from your networks and endpoints, insulating devices from attacks. They said, secure web gateway policies are too restrictive or too relaxed. No secure web gateway can possibly block every threat on the Internet. In an attempt to limit risks, IT teams block too many websites and employees feel overly restricted. Then there's malicious content, which is difficult to spot and costly to remediate. Innocuous webmail attachments, plugins, and software extensions can, dis- t- can disguise harmful code. Once that code travels from a user's browser to their device, it can compromise sensitive data and infect other network devices. And they wrap up saying IT teams have limited power to manage browser activity. Organizations often do not have full visibility into or control over the browsers their teams use, keeping them from meeting compliance standards and securing the user's devices and data over their network. So we, we might think of it like remote desktop for browsers, but the desktop is not being remoted. Only the browser's fetch and render engine is remote. The browser's network communications, um, you know, all the stuff it fetches, all the interpretation it does, the scripting it runs, the rendering it does, all live out Cloudflare. And Cloudflare sends the rendered visual result and only the visual result to the user's browser. And apparently, they're able to pull this off so that the lag is negligible, unnoticeable. And I was thinking about this. You know, given how insanely complex today's web pages have become, reaching out to so many differing third-party servers to pull page sub-assets, it does make a certain sort of sense to outsource that entire process, that entire machine, to a capable and well-connected cloud provider like Cloudflare. Their DNS servers can have massive caches to minimize the need for lookups. And, and, and we know that when you share a big cache, a big DNS cache with a lot of people, the IPs you're looking for are already going to be in the cache. So that's a win. And in fact, they can also have massive caching proxies for the Internet, which means that everything can be network local to that browser cloud engine. So you could theoretically render pages at lightning speed by dramatically reducing all lookups and network transit delays, blast the page together, then intelligently send the post-rendered page result to the user, thus 
completely offloading all of that work and protecting the user. And of course, the whole point of this is that anything that attacks the browser are then also remote since there's not any system to attack at the remote end, just this browser, this virtual browser. And the only thing the user receives are post-digested page image, res image results. Um, and it's interesting also because by the end of today's podcast, where we'll be talking about the hack of the PHP Project's private Git server, we wind up looking at the growing trend toward outsourcing of services for which little local value can be added. If we cannot add any value to a service, why do it ourselves? Especially if there's a downside. And when you think about it, why are we all pulling all of these disparate web browser assets redundantly from all over the internet to each of our own individual web browsers? It really does make a sort of sense to imagine having a browser service that does all of that non-value addable redundant work for us, then sends us only a safe, attack-free, already digested final result. Uh, it's going to be interesting to see how this evolves. Uh, if anyone's curious to learn more, I have a link uh, to the Cloudflare page describing their new browser isolation feature in today's show notes. Uh, they, it's, you know, cloudflare.com slash teams slash browser hyphen isolation. Um, uh, really sort of an interesting idea, I think. Um, and I just wanted to sort of plant a flag on the issue of API security, uh, a report that was recently uh, out from, not surprisingly, a company that is selling API security. Uh, so there's that. But it had some interesting stats. And it is a thing. Um, so the original concept of an API um, didn't need any security. There was no such thing as API security. It was entirely local. Operating systems offered their underlying services through calls to operating system functions, uh, like you like asking the OS to launch a process, to allocate some memory, to open a file and read its contents. And because there were operating system applications, and programmers used these service calls, over time, they became known as application programming interfaces, APIs. And the operating system was then said to be the publisher of these interfaces. So generically, what evolved was the idea of carefully and clearly defining a set of function calls that one entity would publish, meaning to offer, uh, which would then be consumed or used by one or more API users or consumers. The big change then happened with networking, the introduction of networking. Um, it occurred to developers of increasingly sprawling systems and solutions that whereas web browsers had traditionally been using HTTP queries and responses to obtain things to show on the page, there was no reason why the parameters used by traditional local operating systems and other application APIs, which were typically binary parameters, could not be turned into well-formed text and sent over the wire in exactly the same fashion as HTTP web traffic. So, network APIs were born. The problem is that insufficient attention has been given to the security of publicly exposed APIs, and consequently, attacks against APIs are another area of growing malicious interest. So this is forcing enterprises to start taking the security aspects of API adoption more seriously. So the good news is the need for security is on people's radar. And according to this report, 91% of the IT professionals they surveyed claim 
that API security should be considered a priority over the next couple of years, especially since more than 70% of enterprises are estimated to be using more than 50 different sets of APIs. The main aspects of API security, which respondents considered to be a priority, is access control, which was cited by 63% of those, and I'm surprised that number's so low. I mean, like access control is everything. Regular testing, 53%. And anomaly detection and prevention, 43%. Again, I'm not sure why all that's not 100, but okay. So maybe someday. In total, eight out of 10 IT admins want more control over their organization's APIs, you know, like sophisticated fire, you know, API aware firewall-ing. Um, yet tools for that are cu currently kind of lacking. And then a couple of other stats jumped out at me. 19% of enterprises test their APIs for signs of abuse. Uh, okay, meaning that 81% don't. Uh, four out of five organizations enable their partners or users to access data using external APIs, right? That's not surprising. 80%, that's many organ, you know, that's often what these APIs are doing. They're information sharing APIs. The current focus of network API strategies is centered around application performance and development and integration. And finally, 64% of survey respondents said their current solutions do not provide robust API protection. So anyway, there's no takeaway for us at, for us at this point. But I, I just wanted to put it on everyone's radar, as I said. Um, we're seeing an ever-increasing amount of automation. IoT is all about, I mean, like IoT is networked APIs. You know, when I've got... You know, an, an, an IoT thermostat, and I've got a, humid, a humidity reader, and I've got a few of those AC plugs on, on timers. The, that's all network API. And so it's going to explode with the, with, with the continuing explosion in IoT. So I have a feeling that uh, we will be talking about uh, exploits against, explicitly against networked APIs in the future. Um, uh, so spin right, uh, the work on 6.1 is moving nicely forward. Um, and although in one sense, I'm now I'm getting like experience with this conversion, right? And in one sense, it's the same spin right with, but with direct maximum performance hardware support for IDE and SATA drives through ATA and AHCI interfaces. Doesn't sound like a big deal. The implication, though, is that sector addressing is expanded from 32 to 64 bits. Since it was the 32-bit sector addressing that clamped all previous spin right at 4.3 billion sectors, right? 4.3 billion. We're running across that number all the time. That's the number of 32-bit IP addresses on the internet. Well, that's also the number of sectors you can address with 32 bits, 4.3 billion. And back in 04, when I finished with spin right six, you know, that was all we were ever gonna need, right? Uh huh. Well, that's only 2.2 terabytes. So, for Spinrite to be able to run on today's drives, meaning all of today's drives, I am needing to support 64 bit sector addressing. And since sector addressing is Spinrite, I am needing to update everything. But I'm very happy with the way it's coming along. Before I began, I worried that it wasn't going to be any different and that Spinrite 6.0's users upon getting 6.1 might think, what did I wait all this time for? But in the process of moving through the code, I am making many improvements. So Spinrite 6.1's users will definitely notice a different looking Spinrite. Many places where I've, I mean, I've, I've had to rework things because 
the underlying plumbing had to be reworked. And while I'm at it, I'm making it better. So anyway, uh, we're getting there. And I'm, I'm very pleased with the, with the way it's coming. Yay. And Leo, I am very pleased with the way this podcast <laughs> is coming. It's rolling right along now that the microphone solutions have all been applied and all that stuff. Hey, I was going to mention, we interviewed on Triangulation about a year, two years ago, a guy named Scott Petrie. In fact, I remember Scott because he was a former Newton engineer, and I have all this Newton stuff that he sent along. Huh, but cool. uh, he had a company called Authenticate with a number eight that did virtual browsing. It was the same idea as Cloudflare's doing, where you would use their browser in the cloud and render it locally. Ah. Um, so I wonder if Cloudflare acquired them, or maybe they just didn't, it wasn't unique enough. They call it Silo. I remember playing with it at the time and thinking, that's a pretty cool idea. Well, it, and of course, one of the offshoots of Chromium is, right, is that <laughs> rendering is now right. open source. Right. So, right. you, you know... You can render, uh, yeah. Yeah. And just... Uh, uh, I think eventually a lot of what we do in computing, including running Windows, is going to be done that way. Just run on Microsoft servers. is talking about yeah, it, Yeah, they right? already have it. Virtual I mean, desktop. they're like... Yeah. Yeah. I think that's where they're headed. Don't you worry about those pesky bugs. Right. Just, you know... Well, that's a good and... candidate for it. Let them update it. Let them deal with the flaws and all that stuff. It's yeah. on their servers, right? Yeah. And if you can't run Windows for an afternoon... Because of a um, widespread outage, that's pretty okay, you know. <laughs> Take the day off. We should walk more. <laughs> well, there's already, you probably aren't too aware of it, but there's already several gaming services that do this. They have GPUs in the cloud. Google has one called Stadia. Microsoft has xCloud. Uh, Gaikai was bought by PlayStation, Sony, and they do that. Uh, there's GeForce now. And all of them, they rent. they have powerful machines in the cloud, and you can use an iPhone or an Android phone to get AAA gaming because all the work's done remotely. So ah, we've, nice. Yeah, we've seen this now, and I think this is kind of going to be the a big trend in computing. You're right, when Azure goes down, not, not, not so good. And not, go for a not that that ever happens. Yeah. Our, our show today brought to you by, oh, here's a device you're going to love. Uh, you remember I had the original Helm. It was the Triangle server, and I used it uh, to do email. Do, doing uh, your own, you know, Steve can run his own email server because he's pretty sophisticated. Um, I've tried. You know, I have software. I could put it on a computer. But there are a couple of problems. First of all, most Internet service providers block port 25 because they don't want you to set up a spam operation. Uh, so you've got to get around that. It may be a violation of terms of services as well to run your email service. But even if all of that is solved, there's another big problem. Your email never may never get through because most of the big email providers like Google's and, and Gmail um, will block IP addresses, residential IP addresses, presuming again that it's spam. There, you really want an IP address uh, that has been preconditioned or is known to be good. The problem is your internet service provider buys blocks of IP addresses, and who knows where those IP addresses were used in the past, so forth and so on. Helm has solved all these, but they've gone a step further. They created the first personal email server. Very clever. It uses IPsec to log to... So you have the server running on your Helm, but it then sends it out through an IP address that Helm has bought. So they buy batches of IP addresses, test them, precondition them, make sure they work 100%. So you're, you're not violating terms of service. You're just communicating with a Helm server. There's no port 25 egress necessary. And Helm makes sure that those IP addresses work with all the email providers. So it's very clever. You have the email, but they route it through their system to make sure it gets through. And the way they can do this and still protect your privacy is because everything is end-to-end -end encrypted. In fact, I'm holding up my little Helm USB key. The keys to my content are on here. These are my private keys. The Helm is engineered to give you complete security. It's, it's using full disk encryption, so even if somebody stole your Helm, it would be useless to them. Keys are managed by a secure enclave. It has secure boot, so it can't be hacked. TLS encryption gets the certificates from Let's Encrypt, right? Proximity-based two-factor authentication means when you're setting up the server, you put the Helm app on your phone, and then it 
uses Bluetooth LE to recognize the phone. Then you can set it up. Now, you can then use the server uh, from anywhere. But but to get an account on the server, you have to have proximity. It's, pr it's actually a brilliant security method. And then, because stuff happens, Helm also backs up all your email, all your data on their servers, end-to-end -end encrypted. They don't have access using this key. Helm has created an amazing amazing ecosystem and it's just getting better they just released version two of the helm first thing they did is they lowered the price 60 percent it's only 199 dollars to start that's twice the value with double the storage and memory it is much more compact the triangle design was cool and it was great for cooling and stuff but they realized nobody could rack it so it's now a rack mountable passively cooled no fans it won't annoy you uh, i've had a i've had a helm since they first came out and it just quietly sits there and does the job. It's kind of amazing. There are a variety of capacities. You can even get 5, 12, and terabyte. But all the models support external storage with an ex you know, external drive. So you can always expand the storage as much as you need. It's not just email now, though. What's great about the Helm is they use NextCloud so they can do uh, data storage. So you get truly private email. Nobody can see it. Nobody can read it, just you. You get a completely private calendar and contacts account that you can synchronize with. It'll store files. It'll store photos using NextCloud. And there's more to come. They filled me in a little bit on their roadmap. I'm not, I can't tell you. But trust me, some new features you're really going to appreciate. It is a personal server. That's the idea. You own it. You control it. No one else has access to it, not even the folks at Helm. Now, there is an annual service plan. I should mention this so you know. I don't want you to be uh, uh, surprised. It's $99 a year. It gives you ongoing updates. Of course, you want somebody to be consistently updating it. There's always new features, which is great. It, it pays for the storage of your off-site encrypted backups, no matter how big they are. Uh, it gives you access anywhere in the world, and of course, new services. They even do the domain name registration and management, so you can have that custom domain name that you've wanted, your business has wanted. Uh, so you do need to get the annual subscription, $199 to start, plus $99 a year, although once you have the subscription, refer a friend, they'll get $25, and you'll get $25 off your subscription renewal. So refer four friends, and it costs nothing. It's a good deal. Helm believes privacy is a right, not a setting. If you listen to this show, I think you feel the same way. You're going to love the Helm. There's some really good articles. The Intercept did a good article on the version one of the Helm explaining how it worked, all the technologies involved. Um, there's some other great articles. If you go to the website, you'll see them there. Helm was named Time Magazine's one of the best inventions of 2019. That's when we had Geary from uh, Helm on our show. We had him on the new screensavers. That's when I first learned about it. Actually, I think I read about it in Hacker News. Uh, and I was really impressed. Uh, contacted Helm, had Geary on the show, got one. I, I paid for it, bought it, and uh, was really amazed by not only the quality of it, the, the thinking behind it, really quite smart, but also the support was superb. You need one. If you want real privacy for your files, for your photos, for your email, go to the Helm, T H E H E L M dot com slash security now. You'll get a coupon for free shipping for addresses in the US only, and you'll have it soon. The Helm, actually, when they first <laughs> when they first did their campaign with us, they sold out like instantly. People were so excited about this. And I had to keep telling people, I don't know if you remember, if you order now, you'll get one in July, that kind of thing. I think, they're, I think, they're, I think they've got it down now a little bit better. Uh, go to, you'll find out. Go to thehelm.com slash security now. You know what happens when you have something this good? People buy it up. So, um, you know, get it now before they run out. Thehelm.com slash security now. But don't worry, they'll make more. It's really proven to be very popular with a certain kind of geek. People who know and understand privacy, but also know and understand how hard it is to do it yourself. This is the way to do it. Thehelm.com slash security now. Really great people with a great product. Okay, Steve, I'm ready to learn all about PHP. So I read all the coverage of this in the tech press. Yeah. And I've looked at the source materials and no one appears to understand 
that this had to primarily be a joke hack. Oh, not malicious, but a joke. I'm it, uh, see if you don't think so. By okay. the time I give you my perspective, um, I think it was perpetrated by someone who arranged to compromise either the PHP project's private Git server, as they believe, or the account of someone. Um, perhaps I'm missing something, but everyone appears to be taking this like a super serious attempt to actually sneak a backdoor into PHP. They committed, they committed uh, updates that had backdoors in them, basically, right? Yeah. No? Okay, so, you know, uh, the code is a backdoor. Okay. Uh, sort of. I'll explain that in a minute. But to the degree that it's a backdoor, it's not some sneaky, stealthy backdoor hiding in the shadows. Yeah, in it's fact, a PHP says, well, we, we, we noticed and fixed it within minutes, right? Well, it's a backdoor embellished with big neon signs <laughs> reading, hey, check out this wide open backdoor oh. I just created here. Oh, okay. So, yeah, it's a backdoor, but it's screaming to be found. Okay, yeah, so here's yeah. the code that was submitted. I've got the code in the show notes, and I know our, our listeners can't hear it, but I'll explain what the code does. So as we know, every browser query to a server identifies the browser and typically a collection of its add-ons, which the, have, may have been added to the browser, by sending a user agent header. U-S-E-R hyphen A-G-E-N-T colon space and then the, the, the value of the header. The PHP code that, that was inserted into the repository, which you've got on screen now in the show notes, it extracts the value of the HTTP user agent header from the HTTP underscore globals array that was built by PHP to describe the query. It holds that string, uh, or it holds that value, the value of that header in a string named ENC, which it had declared up at the top. It then checks to see whether the first eight characters of the user agent header value are Zerodium, Z-E-R-O-D-I-U-M. If it finds that the user agent header does indeed begin with the eight characters Zerodium. It then feeds the rest of the string, skipping those first eight characters, as one would, into PHP's insanely dangerous eval function, which interpretively executes whatever PHP code is passed to it, which is whatever is contained in the balance of the string. And... Driving the joke home as if the presence of the trigger string test for Zerodium were not glaring enough, our hacker then tosses in a quoted string reading in all caps, quote, remove this colon space, and then it says sold to Zerodium, comma, mid-2017. <laughs> <No. laughs> it's like... What? <laughs> so it's, a, what? It's, a, it's an old exploit. Is that what is that what he's trying to say? Well, yeah, that that it, it's exactly the, this person who put it in two days ago was trying to say this. Somehow you've missed this for the last four years. Uh, okay, so okay, the official PHP documentation for the eval function reads: caution, <laughs> caution, bold, larger type. Then it says the eval language construct is in italics very dangerous. Flawed. <laughs> oh, exactly. That's why we put it like, in. <laughs> oh, exactly. You know, because it allows extraction. Of arbitrary PHP code. I'm sorry, it, it allows execution of arbitrary PHP code. Then then again, italics, all italics, this sentence, it's the its use thus is discouraged. Yeah. But but of course, but it's there, yeah. right? And they say, if you have 
carefully verified that there is no other option than to use this construct. Pay special attention, and now we're going to switch into italics again, not to pass any user-provided data, uh, now back to non-italics, into it without properly validating it beforehand. Okay, so, of course, feeding user-provided data into the eval function is precisely what this little glaringly obvious snippet of code does. Um, but it's that it's so glaringly obvious, deliberately calling attention to itself with the all caps remove this, as, as in what? Remove this before use? Uh, or don't leave any of this in here since it's a hack that was sold to Zerodium many years ago? It makes no sense. Um, it doesn't and, execute. And by the way, evaluating it doesn't make sense either. It doesn't do anything, right? Well, okay, so so first of all, Zerodium's CEO was not impressed by this. He tweeted that the culprit was a troll. Yeah, uh, that's his yeah, word. that's accurate. Yeah, co co commenting that quote likely this is the, the the guy the CEO likely the researcher parens plural researchers who found this bug slash exploit tried to sell it. To many entities, but none wanted to buy this crap, comma, so they <laughs> burned it for fun. Okay, now wait, what? Maybe he also misunderstood this. It was a commit to the PHP Git server two days ago. It, it's not like it's been hiding in PHP since 1950 and no one noticed it until now. I mean, that entire block was added, not like a few characters changed to, to like make this happen. And, and also, interestingly, I thought this was interesting. The name of the actual header being checked is HTTP underscore user underscore agent. It's got two T's on the end. Um, I checked in with Rasmus. You know, Rasmus Vind, who, as, as we know, my go-to guy for all things PHP, to verify that PHP would, in fact, populate the HTTP globals array with any and all client headers it found in the query. He wrote some code to demonstrate that it does. So we'd have to presume that using... The deliberately misspelled twice. It's not just misspelled once because you because uh, uh, he's using it and then he's also taking the size of it elsewhere. That using HTTP underscore user underscore agent with the extra T was the hacker's way of hiding the use of what is actually a custom header in a lookalike header that might go unnoticed maybe I mean, I saw it right away in a current, but on the other hand, I program an assembler, so I look for details. But, you know, maybe you would miss it in a cursory scan. Um, it might also be that commandeering the actual HTTP user agent header for this purpose, that is, you know, Zerodium and then some code, could have unforeseen side effects like causing the query to be blocked elsewhere. And finally, in an exercise, I don't know, dry wit or maybe a twisted sense of humor, <laughs> that the hacker gave their commit the title typo fixed. A and in the detail, just says, fixes minor typo. But it's a block of code. I mean, anyone who looks at it sees a block of code, that, you know, that's been added. So, uh, you know, on the serious side, what we definitely had here was a true, completely unauthorized incursion into the PHP private Git server. Had it gone unnoticed, if a, if a tiny tweak had been dropped in, for example, the damage throughout the industry could have been substantial. Um, but it was designed to be seen, to, you know, like, first of all, typo fixed, and it's a block of new code? So, again, you, you can't possibly... And then this Zerodium with the all caps remove this. 
you know, your eye goes immediately to that. So um, yesterday, Nikita Popov, or Popov, I guess, a well-known software developer at JetBrains uh, and an active open source contributor. He, he works with PHP, uh, the LLVM project, and Rust efforts. He posted under the subject, Changes to Git Commit Workflow. And he wrote, Hi, everyone. Yesterday, 2021, 328. So two days ago for us, he said, Two malicious commits, only because it was like that block was created in two pieces, were pushed to the PHP hyphen source repo from the names of Rasmus Lerdorf, the creator, the creator of PHP, of PHP <laughs> okay. uh-huh, and myself. Oh, wow. He said, we don't yet know how exactly this happened. It sounds like the credentials were compromised. I would, th- I think it's a credential hack, but he says for whatever reason, he says no. He says, but everything points towards a compromise of the git.php.net server, he says, parens, rather than a compromise oh. of an individual git account. Well, that's much worse. Actually. Yeah, Exactly. <laughs> He said, while investigation is still underway, and then, Leo, that is the point, what you just said. While investigation is still underway, we have decided that maintaining our own Git infrastructure is an unnecessary <laughs> yes. security risk. No one else does. Yeah. And that yeah. we will discontinue the git.php.net server. Instead, the repositories on GitHub which were previously only mirrors, will become canonical. Good. This means, yes, that changes should now be pushed directly to GitHub rather than to git.php.net. While previously, write access to repositories was handled through our homegrown Karma system, you will now need to be part of the PHP organization on GitHub. If you are not part of the organization yet or don't have access to a repository, you should have access to contact me at, and he has his, his email address, with your php.net and GitHub account names, as well as the permissions you're currently missing. Membership in the organization requires two-factor authentication to be enabled. This change also means that it is now possible to merge pull requests directly from the GitHub web interface. We're reviewing the repositories for any corruption beyond the two referenced commits. Please contact security at php.net if you notice anything. Regards, (laughs) Nikita. So this is all good. The PHP guys are taking the opportunity of this hack to move their work from their private server where they have been responsible for much more than just the code it contains. They're moving to GitHub yeah. where they only need to be responsible for the code it contains and the GitHub folks get to worry about the security of all the rest of the infrastructure, the bandwidth, the capacity, the storage, authentication, <laughs> attacks, and so on. Focus on your strengths, in other words. Yes. Yes. And it's worth noting that as trends go, this is definitely a trend. I'll remind everyone that about three and a half years ago, when I was participating in that Digicert Customer Advisory Board meeting in Utah, and I casually referred to my server rack at level three. And everyone looked at me like I had just dropped an F-bomb on the Disney Channel. Uh, And I said, what? And one of the guys said, uh, Steve, no one does their own hardware anymore. And at that point, I thought that I'd best not to mention (laughs) that I also code in assembly language. It's actually an interesting thing. I've been thinking about this. Because a lot of people, well, a good example is in the password management sphere. There are a certain number of uh, more sophisticated users, probably listeners to this show, say, oh, no, 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 I don't want to trust my password vault 
to LastPass or 1Password or any centralized thing. I'm going to uh, have my own password vault. And while on the one hand, I understand, I mean, you're certainly, you know, eliminating uh, a target because, uh, you know, everybody knows there's a bunch of vaults at LastPass's storage, wherever that is. But on the other hand, you now have to attain the level of professional security that LastPass or 1Password presumably has protecting the vaults. You're assuming the security risk. Just sticking it on Dropbox, I don't know if that's more secure. So it's a it's a interesting question and trade-off. And I often tell people, I'm gonna I you know, I trust LastPass to or Bitwarden, because you can do that yourself. You can self-host Bitwarden. But I trust them to do a better job than I'm going to do. It's their full-time job. Same thing with GitHub. It's their full-time job, right? Yes. And, you know, I think this, and certainly in the case of these guys, it makes sense. But one thing we have to remember or recognize is that it, put, it inherently, this approach, this consolidation, which is sort of what we're talking about, puts a lot of eggs into many fewer baskets. This makes the care and handling of those baskets more, far more important more than ever. Critical, yeah. You know, you know, we do see reports, and you were talking about it, of, and I hear about it on your on the other podcasts, of spotty outages of major services mm -hmm. that transiently bring down all users of the affected service at once. Um, and although I haven't mentioned it before, one of the more notable recent victims of a ransomware attack was one of the largest managed service providers who's been hit with a $20 million ransom demand. So, you know, this sort of consolidation is more cost effective overall, but I think we need to appreciate that it also creates an inherently more fragile solution. Um, this consolidation and refactoring of function and responsibility is clearly going to happen. Um, you know, and a school district can give its students a day or two or a week off if their informatics systems go down. But mission-critical environments like a hospital, you know, might not be able to withstand transient outages. So there are, it, it needs to be, you know, it, just as you said, Leo, it's a trade-off. So, yeah, and you need to understand the trade-off. It's just not inherently better, right? You know, right? Um, and maybe it is, but you need. But the burden now is on you. If you if you're going to host your own Git repository, <laughs> then the burden is on you to keep it secure. And yeah. apparently, they weren't able to. So. Well, and I think on balance, the industry owes this jokester its thanks. You know, he Good or point. she made PHP more secure and and more secure a bull as and a didn't actually do anything malicious nope just called attention to the fact that he could have yeah yes yeah exactly so, so yeah he's he's in a way did us all a favor yeah yeah I mean, PHP he dropped a is big used everywhere. blurb you know a big yeah. uh, you know something you could not fail to notice that you know no didn't pass any smell test you know, and everyone's like Whoa! So what? What the GitHub guys were upset about? I mean, sorry. The 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 what the PHP guys were upset about was that this happened to them. What the tech press thought was important was, oh my God, a backdoor was right. inserted. It's like, no, you know, this this was a good thing, folks, not a bad thing. Yeah, I understand the reaction though. You know, um, Randall Schwartz got arrested. Uh, because uh, oh. he was working uh, at a company, I won't name the name of the company, working at a company and found a flaw and he didn't exploit it. He told them about it and they fi they fired him and got him arrested because they said, you're hacking our system. And oh. and I think this is not that unusual where, you know, it, there's a, it's a gray line. You're not supposed to be nosing around in there, but if you find a security flaw... I think it, you're duty bound to tell the company you found it. This is a good way to do yeah. it anonymously without getting in trouble. Who knows? For all we know, it could have been Rasmus's son or something like that that, that did it. It's a good thing. Um, there's somebody saying he's not a white hat, not a gray hat, not a black hat. He's a clown hat hacker. Okay. 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 Well, and speaking of Rasmus, who that Rasmus is the father of PHP. Lerdorf, yeah. My, my Rasmus is a... PHP guru, 
Uh, Leo, you've got a browser in front of you. Yes. You need to go to uh, www.hiveworkshop.com. Ooh. That is Rasmus's work. This is the guy who does Zenforo. Well, no. So this is the guy who is a listener of ours. Oh, he's our listener. Who went, when I was saying that I, I was like scratching my head about how am I going to integrate Squirrel with Zenforo, right. which is written in PHP. Right. He said, I use Zenforo. I'd be happy to help. Nice. And, uh, you know, so this is a Zenforo is in, forum. But Believe it or not, that is a the most crazy, <laughs> heavily reskinned Zen. I mean, it's unrecognizable. For, for fans of World of Warcraft. That's yes, cool. it, uh, it bills itself uh, hiveworkshop.com, the number one largest Warcraft 3, whatever this is, reforged modding community. And I have no idea what that means, but it is a tour de force in PHP based CSS and HTML reskinning. So, I mean, I, I can barely see Zenforo as I know it under yeah, there. Yeah. But that's wow. Good. That's funny. Yeah, yeah, great graphics and and <laughs> performance. And I he feel moved like to the latest uh, uh, Zenforo and is apparently cleaning up some some little debris. But anyway, I just wanted to give him a shout out because he's nice. uh, he's been a big help to us and uh, and to the podcast. Thank you, Rasmus. Hiveworkshop.com. You get a little plug. How about that? And you get a little respite for a week. That concludes this. Thrilling, gripping edition of Security Now. Get me some PHP. <laughs> Our own personal joker titled this one. You'll find uh, Steve at his website, grc.com. That's where, of course, Spinrite lives, the world's best hard drive recovery and maintenance utility. 6.1's coming. Steve's, Steve's getting there, making I'm some real it. good progress. Uh, if you buy 6.0 now, you'll get a free upgrade to 6.1. More importantly, you'll get to participate in the development of it. Uh, everybody, if you have a, I, I keep saying if you have a hard drive, you should have spin right. But because now it works so well and does so much yeah. on SSDs, if you yeah. have any drive, you need spin right. Um, I'm going to be get, get a new system. I'm going to be getting my spin right out to work on the M.2 SSD in it, and it has a spinning drive in it too. So it, it will drive you happy. Spin right before you, uh, spin, that should be your motto. <laughs> spin right before you go. Uh, you'll also find 16 kilobit versions of this show for the bandwidth impaired, uh, handwritten, human written transcriptions of uh, every word. Thank you, Elaine. Uh, you'll also find 64 kilobit audio there. There's a feedback form on the website, grc.com slash feedback. There's also a lot of free stuff, including Shields Up, which is really uh, the premier router testing platform before anytime you install a new router you should go to shields up uh he's also got a lot of other interesting stuff it's a, it's a rabbit hole you can go down and spend some time <laughs> grc.com he also is on the twitter at sggrc you can leave him a dm there his dms are open slide into steve's dms uh we have copies of the show at our website of course as with all our shows 64 bit 64 kilobit audio Plus uh, video, for some reason, we shoot video of it. Um, that's all at twit.tv slash SN. If you're watching us do it live, we do it live right after Mac Break Weekly of a Tuesday. Usually it's around 1.30 to 2 p.m. Pacific. That'll be uh, 4.30 to 5 p.m. Eastern, 20.30 to 2.200 UTC. Just, you know what, we're on all day. Go to twit.tv slash live. There's a live video stream and live audio stream. Um, you can check that out while you're doing that chat with our chat room. They're watching live too, irc.twit.tv. Uh, you can also comment asynchronously if you listen to the podcast uh, at uh, Steve's forums at grc.com. We also have forums at twit.community, and we have a Mastodon instance. That's the Twitter clone that's federated. It's really cool. We now have enough, I think, uh, critical mass, more than 1,000 users, so it's, it's, it's fun. It's perking up. Uh, that's twit.social. You're more than welcome to join. Uh, I think, though, if I might, I'd like to encourage you. There's lots of ways to watch this show. If there's even a YouTube channel. Get a podcast program and subscribe. That way you'll get it automatically. You won't have to worry about missing an episode. And if you would, if they allow reviews in that podcast player, please give us a nice review. 
five stars would be more than welcome. Steve, thank you very much. Have a great evening. Is there an Italian dinner in your uh, in your forecast for this week? Oh, yeah. Steak tonight, Italian on Sunday. <laughs> Steve's fully vaccinated, and he's living it up. Ah, <laughs> uh, yeah. I'm right after you, Steve. Have a great week. We'll see you next time Bye, on buddy. Security Now. Bye. Hey, what's going on, everybody? I am Ant Pruitt, and I want to tell you about my show, Hands on Photography, here on Twit TV. Each and every week, Thursday, that is, I like to sit down and share with you the best tips and tricks that are going to help make you a better photographer. And it's not always about Photoshop. It's not always about just having the biggest and baddest and bestest camera. It can be the simplest of things like leave your eye open when you're looking through the viewfinder. All of these simple tips can really help step your photography game up. So subscribe to the show today. That's twit.tv slash hop. And I look forward to talking to you soon. Security now.